right now at the University of Toronto at the Centre for Research in Healthcare Engineering, um, part of my time and the rest of my time on my own private consulting and uh, known as healthcare, health engineer. Uh, originally, I trained as a biomedical engineer and spent, that was, it was obvious that I would go into healthcare uh, early on. About 25 years ago, um, as I tell people, I took a left when I should have really taken a right and ended up in administration and spent 25 years in healthcare administration, the last six as the CEO of two different hospitals in Toronto. Along the way, though, never quite lost the flavor of, of engineering and um, later on began to look at simulation, began to look at agent-based simulation, and then maybe three or four years ago discovered analogic. And then when I stepped away from being a, a hospital executive and back into the engineering field, I've taken on a, a much stronger and deeper interest in how healthcare hangs together and particularly how policies work or don't work. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but just if you're expecting to hear anything really brilliant from me about how to use Analogic, I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, what I hope I might be able to do is to, to show how sometimes taking a look at a fairly complex problem, you can find ways of understanding it a lot better. And so it's in the use of simulation um, that I have found that you know, my use of Analogic has, has gone ahead. This is where things normally start. Um, especially in North America, uh, people get very excited about this, this chart, um, mostly because if you have a look at it, you'll see there are seven countries compared on approximately, I think, eight or nine uh, different categories. And our, the two North American uh, countries, Canada, where I come from, and in the United States, um, we bring up the rear as positions six and seven in terms of ranking. Um, by various uh, criteria, how well the healthcare system works. And it usually uh, motivates a big discussion about how you can reform it again. I don't expect you to read the details on this, but this really is the motivation. Almost every developed country is trying to do something about its healthcare system. Uh, and it, it, it is encapsulated in this type of thing here. So what I'm talking about and what I really want to try to do uh, today is to cover three areas. First of all, talk a little bit about how we're trying to understand healthcare in a little bit more detail than and maybe in a more integrated way than people uh, tend to do normally. And then look a little bit at how the model is emerging. And then finally, some of the early, work, early findings that we have in terms of building a model that we hope will eventually become the simulation that we would want it to be. So what we, our goal is eventually to build a simulation model that would allow us to, first of all, configure a model to a national system, then to select from available strategies, and finally see what would happen if those strategies were actually played out. I do this from some uh, uh, history because where I live in Ontario, there have been some, um, well, some interesting examples where vast amounts of money have been invested in what seemed like really great ideas, but three or four years later, the ideas hadn't actually materialized in terms of any measurable improvement in the system. And although everyone was well-intentioned, obviously we didn't understand things well enough, so our intention would be just to see if we can discover a little bit better how the system will work. And that's true. So that's where I want to be. So um, what I'm going to talk about, this is you know, what I'm calling version 0.9 of the workflow, so you can put everything in perspective. We're basically taking um, documentation from healthcare system, moving it through uh, a, a, a content analysis process so that we can start to unravel and piece together the various bits and pieces that make up what we think is a, a viable, not necessarily a successful, but a viable healthcare system then move that through some sort of, of using UML so that we can get some structure around this in a uniform way, then plugging that into Analogic as a platform both to build up the model and then to run scenarios. Off to one side, we want to quantify this using data that we're deriving mostly from OECD and running that through statistical analysis through, uh, through R. So there, the, we'll come back to this in a few minutes just to show uh, how this is working out for us so far. The data that we're using comes with intentionally chosen um, to use one encapsulated system. And it might not come as a surprise to you. have been listening to me for two or three minutes now. You can probably tell I don't come from Canada. Um, so I have a, I, my, my, uh, my origins are in Ireland, so I have a lot of information about how that system works. But it's an interesting system to study. 
um, because it has, they have documented really well over the last 20 years their strategic plans. Three times they have, they have done it, once in 97, once in 2001, and again in 2011. And they have documented it really well. And if you mean following world economies, you know that Ireland is one of the countries that suffered badly in the economic downturn of 2008. So they have this external shock that you can plug into the system and look and see what actually happened when something that you didn't intend to happen impinges on the system. So it turns out to be a quite an interesting one. And that we're going to codify using the content analysis. The second place we go for data then is, first of all, within the Irish system. Again, the Central Statistics Office in Ireland is quite flush with good information, so we should be able to quantify what we're finding. Um, OECD health statistics, uh, insofar as they are consistent and standardized, are very, very helpful. And then there's something called the Eurostat database, which is within the European community. And that one we codify using statistical analysis. So our first challenge is to see how does the healthcare system hang together. Um, this model is actually derived from a publication from about 1999 where they call it accidental logics, where it, in fact they've traced the history of the NHS in England, the, uh, the Canadian healthcare system and the US healthcare systems, plural, um, and showed that there are three major entities that tend to, uh, that tend to cause the system to evolve the way it does. I won't go into the detail here except to show you that you can actually compartmentalize healthcare and show that there are outputs that relate to the population, outputs that relate to patients who are a subset of the population, and then that there are three major drivers, the insurers, the, uh, the, the funders, in other words, the providers, and then what we call the market section, which is the people who run hospitals. So here what we want to do is to try to, to unravel, to take apart the system, looking at its elements, its goals, and its strategies. And the sorts of elements of the healthcare system that we're looking at, they are, first of all, obviously, people as patients. But we need to distinguish between people and patients because it will become important for us to know which aggregate statistic are we looking at. If we're looking at health status, it's the whole population. If we're looking at outcomes, it's patients. And I think that distinction, just for strictly uh, uh, ratio points of view, is important to have. Secondly, we have physicians as a very dominant provider of care, but other clinicians as well who are part of that equation of patient, of patient care. Hospitals, clinics, and other organizations, which tend to be aggregates of people, aggregates of clinicians, but a little different to the individual practitioners as physicians. Corporations, including insurers. Now, depending on which jurisdiction you come from, in, in Canada, the insurer is the government, but there are corporations that are involved in providing something to healthcare, for instance, in pharma, where pharma is not covered under our healthcare insurance system. In the US, of course, the organizations, the enterprises, are more likely to be involved in the insurance business itself, as well as the, the federal government and state governments being involved in that. So there's a lot of complexity and at least diversity around that. And I went backwards. And then regulators. And on a system like this, when you look at the system, and I'm sure if any of you have tried to model healthcare, if you build a very primitive model, it blows up or it disappears. It either goes out of control uh, because there's nothing really limiting it, or it disappears because it over, has overcapacity. So the significance of regulators um, in a modeling environment is every bit as important as in the, in the real environment to make sure that things go the way we hope that they would go. So the second thing, that's the elements, looking at the, the, the multiple goals of healthcare. And this is where it starts to get a little bit hairy, because the, the, what I showed you um, in the original chart was that the outcomes, we tend to look at outcomes at a gross level of, of, of life expectancy and mortality. And certainly, if you, if you have a good healthcare system, uh, it means that uh, people won't die as soon as they would. But if you actually look at the reasons why healthcare is being reformed, it has much more to do, well, first of all, other determinants of health will influence how well people do apart from how we manage the system. The other one that seems to come to mind much more, and it certainly applies in Canada, and I believe it applies in almost every country, including the US, the motivation for the Affordable Care Act really is to allow as many people as possible to have access to the health care. It doesn't necessarily talk about how they do, it just talks about how, what their access will be. And then the last one, when you talk about patient-centered care, we want to feel that we're satisfied with it. So the criteria that are used are actually uh, 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 need to be pulled apart as well. 
the strategies, well, insurance, you know about that in the United States and in Canada and, and in, in, in European countries. Sectoral focus, focusing on primary care as opposed to acute care. Capital investment, well, we've known about that one for years. Um, regulations, who gets to say who gets into the system. And then governance, do you have private systems, do you have public systems? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't quite finish that point. Governance, do you have private systems owned by the government or do you have by, by enterprises or public systems? Finally, how do you actually look at how the relationships are? The classic ways with regression models and the uh, qualitative studies, the sort of thing. These are the two actually I'm pulling together. The, quality, the quantitative models use an econometric thing. I won't go into too far. The Cobb-Douglas func uh, function is used basically to do a regression and say if these things are here, this has an impact by this percentage with this significance. But what we're looking at is an economic behavioral one, which is who gets care. This comes from Bob Evans in Victoria. Who gets care, who gets paid, and who pays for the care. And it's amazing how that actually gives you the processes and the relationships. So the first in the care process is the patient. We can segregate the patients by, by age, by economic status. And it turns out that that matrix turns out to be important. We can separate by locus of care in a hospital or in the community. Um, and we can look at the decisions that are being taken. So how the care is delivered is not just a simple matter of somebody showing up and they get care and they have an outcome. We need to dissect it a little more. Who gets paid? Well, the provider gets paid, but in what manner? Um, how they get paid? Are they paid by salary? Are they paid by fee for service? Are they paid by capitation? And then the selection process, again, we're back to gatekeeping, but in order to look at how the payment actually is, is triggered, we need to understand how the delivery of care is going to be there. And then finally, who pays? Well, classically, you expect the patient to pay for the care, but insurance becomes a huge, a huge part of this, and how insurance is managed, whether it's personal, by the employer, or by social, uh, as in Canada or in many European countries, it's fully funded socially. And then you have institutions, both charitable, taking them, uh, paying for things, or government funding. So I mentioned earlier on I had this workflow. So this is what actually happens. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, except to show you that on the left-hand left -hand side, um, we have, that's the analysis of the documents from the Irish system and all of the entities that, are, that we found there. We then translated that into the middle, into classes on the UML side, and then finally that becomes an analogic menu of all of the classes that we use in analogic. So what are we using analogic for? Well, the first one we're using it for is simply to just to try to visualize the inputs that we have. So we were able to take in all of the OECD data and select by country and by type of statistic. So we were able to look at employment. Um, this is an interesting one. There's a dip there. This shows the political changes in the, in the UK in the transition from the Thatcher government to the Blair government. That's, that's what that big dip is, and then the rise up again. If you continue it over, you're kind of into the Cameron government again. And this is what happens in Ireland. You can see the, 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 the peak as the Celtic tiger grew and then faded away uh, in 2008. So you can get an awful lot of information about what's going on there. The really interesting part about putting this together with Analogic is that there are two or th at least two ways of building up our model. And the first way, obviously, is to go to the aggregate approach where we would use uh, system dynamics to be able to take and aggregate up all of the information that we have and use that to try to articulate how the influences will work. And you know, I don't need to tell you about that. It's obviously, we use the interactions of major groups the interesting thing is that the gross outputs are accessible, but the inner workings are not. The tantalizing thing is to go to agent-based modeling, where we can actually use adaptive behavior. We can use the behavior at that granular level, still aggregate it up into the system dynamics model if we want. But the really interesting thing is that we might want to let the mechanisms run out on their own. And our suspicion is that a system dynamics model would not show the failures that we have seen, whereas an agent-based model will allow for the external shocks to implement, to, to execute at a low level and then roll their way up into the aggregate information. So I've kind of galloped through that at a, at a fairly rapid pace. 15 minutes is not a long time to talk about something that takes up half your life, but I think it's fairly, it, it, it's quite interesting. What I'd like to talk a little bit though in, in wrapping up is where the, the search is going and the research. Quantification, we still have to go through uh, that the, the larger analysis of the, of the OECD data, 
And in particular, uh, we're going to use frontier uh, methodology, which is basically using a maximum likelihood estimation where we are looking for the gap between performance and efficient, the, the, and, and idealized performance. And we've done it a couple of runs at it, but we have not really, are not satisfied with the way it's been working, and we're hoping that we can actually move uh, the analogic model up by using um, OpQuest to do that. And the last and really tantalizing thing is to use microsimulation. Microsimulation has a lot in common with agent-based simulation, um, in that microsimulation will actually build up a synthetic database which in most traditional ways is allowed to run linearly. It just runs on its own. You give it the rules and everyone, all the agents or the actors do their own thing. Whereas with, with, um, with, with agent-based modeling and the synthetic database that you would take from microsimulation, we hope to be able to, well, to, to configure a system and allow it to evolve in a dynamic and adaptive sort of way. So John, I've kind of raced through that, but I made it to the end, I think in 15 minutes, for which I am to be congratulated. Um, but I'd be glad to answer any questions, um, and I'm sure you'll have way more questions than I can have answers, but I'd love to have a bit of a discussion for five or 10 minutes. So thank you very much.